I want to remember Brother Moses' meeting coming up here. Brother Danny mentioned to us tonight. Brother Moses is a very fine gentleman. As you know, he uh, about a year ago lost his wife and uh, has two, three young children to raise. And I know uh, he's a very exemplary fellow, and I know he does a good job. I've heard him speak a couple of times. He's a very good speaker as well. Who will be saved? Brother Danny read there a moment ago in Luke chapter 13. Read how the Lord was nearing the end of His earthly existence when He uttered those words, Luke 13, verse 22 through 30. His last preaching tour, you might say. He was preaching of the coming of the kingdom. And when He says, What shall we like in the kingdom of God? is like leaven which a man, woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all left. It's a wonderful thing, the way the kingdom is described. But resistance was growing <clears throat> against the Lord at that time as well. Book of John, chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, it's about the same time Jesus was in Jerusalem, it says the Jews took up stones to stone him. And, uh, and even though his, he was taking his time, his eyes were fixed upon Jerusalem. Luke chapter 18, verses... 30 and 30, 31 through 33. If I can get to it. There it is. Uh, we read how the Lord says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and we mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him the third day he rises again. The Lord continued his walk, his journey which had been going on his whole life towards Jerusalem. The answer the Lord gives to this question, were well, there are few that will be saved, who will be saved, is an answer that really strikes the very essence of our existence. The essence of our existence, my friends, is to prepare for eternity. That's why we're here. While we're here tonight, while we're here on this earth, James chapter 4, verse 14, What is your life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Matthew 16, verse 26, But what is a man profit? He gains the whole world and loses his own soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you feel tonight, my friends, secure in your salvation? Is your salvation based on some emotional experience you had years ago? Is it based on what others have taught you? Maybe your family? Is it based on your opinion of yourself? Is it based upon what the Bible says? In Acts chapter 17, Paul was in Berea. And Luke makes his comment, verse 11. He says, And these were more fair-minded Jews there in Berea than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They knew their salvation was, was based upon getting it right. So we see tonight this question is asked of the Lord in verse 23. Lord, are there few who will be saved? Now, is that a worthy question? question was not passed on, we don't believe, by an apostle, but by someone in the audience. You know, religious questions, as anyone can tell you, sometimes can be a two-edged sword. Sometimes they can be just someone honestly seeking to find the truth about the subject. Other times it can be just out of curiosity. They may be testing you to see if where you stand on something. They did that to the Lord on occasion. They can be trying to justify a position as the uh, I believe it was one of the lawyers said unto the Lord uh, who is my neighbor and the Lord uttered him a parable that <laughs> set him in his place or he someone asking a question might be just trying to put you in a box trying to trap you somewhat now what was this person's motivation we don't know but some of the Jews thought that all Jews would be saved, but not the Gentiles. 
All Jews would enter into the kingdom of heaven, but not the Gentiles. Others felt, including some rabbis of Jesus' day, they taught that since only two of those who escaped Egypt, bondage in Egypt under Moses, were allowed to enter into the promised land, meaning Joshua and Caleb, then there would be very, very few in heaven. Maybe the question should have been, should have asked, how can I be saved? In what way can I be saved? The Bible tells us one cannot be saved by the law of Moses. I don't care how many times you keep the Sabbath. If you uh, have all your male children circumcised, as Abraham did, or all these other things, that will get you into heaven. Romans chapter 9, verse 31, But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Only one kept the law perfectly. And that was Jesus Christ. Only by Jesus Christ, my friends, can we be saved. John 14, verse 6, the Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but my name. Only through the gospel can we be saved. His gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation of those who believe, Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God. And faith to faith is written, the just shall live by faith. Many today go to extremes in regards to the doctrine of salvation. You have some people that believe that God is predestined that only a, a very few people will be saved. It's called Calvinism. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God says, speaking for God, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. Then there's others that go to the opposite extreme and believe in what's called universalism. That God will save everybody. That's exactly where religious liberalism is headed today. When it says, you know, you're saved by cheap grace, as I would say. They call it just grace. You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace alone. You're saved by faith alone. All that's heading towards is, well, everybody's saved. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, Not all sin in me, Lord, Lord, shall in the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Today, the gospel is available to all in obedience to that gospel that we'll see here in a moment. Now, Jesus, in answering this person, says in verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow, straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Conditions for entrance into heaven. He turns that question around to what he says there in verse, uh, verse 24, actually verse 23. He said to them, those who asked that question in verse 23. You know, the Lord did not come to this earth to gratify men's curiosity, but to guide their consciences. You know, I was thinking today about how Nicodemus came to the Lord, and before he could really get the question out, the Lord guided him towards the truth. But here, were, here was someone that seemed to be pretty self-confident. You know, when he says, you know, Lord, are there a few being, are there a few, including myself, well, you know, all us few, will we only be ones that will be saved? The Lord says in verse 24, strive to enter. That's an interesting phrase. It's a Greek word that means to, means agonizomai, which means to agonize to seek a prize in the games. If you've ever watched someone run a, a relay race or any race, they agonize. They try to get that last bit of, of strength out of them to get up, go over the finish line. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he declared, he had compared rather the life of the Christian and his own life to that of an athlete. He says in chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. But they do now they do it to obtain a perishable prize, we need a perishable, therefore I run also. 
not with uncertainty, for thus I fought, not as one who beats the air, but I disciplined my body and bring into subjection. King James, I believe, says, I pummel my body. I believe that's correct. Lest when I had preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Agonize. Agonize. Brethren, it takes the grace of God, the blood of Christ, for us to be saved. Yes, but it takes our devotion, our complete devotion here in heaven. It, it takes striving in prayer. Most 15, verse 30, Paul said that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. It takes striving against Satan and sin. Because Satan has a, as Brother Philip prayed, Satan seems to have a stranglehold on our world right now, our nation. Hebrews 12, verse 4. Striving for holiness, separateness from the world. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, protecting wholeness in the fear of, of God. And Jesus describes that focus of that striving is in verse 24, to enter through the narrow or the straight or the difficult gate. That's what that word means, really difficult. That difficult gate. He said it earlier in Matthew 7, verse 13, 14. He says, entering by the narrow gate, a straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, then there are few who find it. That gate is narrow. It's not so broad to exclude belief in Jesus. John 8, verse 24. Some folks would have you believe just as long as you're a nice person. You like uh, small animals and children. You will make it to hell. That's how broad that gate is that they try to get through. Not, that gate is not so tolerant as to fail to repent of one's sins. Others believe, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. Just kind of let it go. Just forget about it. Don't seek forgiveness. You know, don't change your life in some way, in your mind. The Bible says, Acts 17, verse 30, the time of this ignorance God went out, but now He commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Not so timid as to fail to confess Christ. We thought about that when we when we obey the gospel, we not only believe, repent, and are baptized, we confess the name of Jesus Christ. That he is the Son of God. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. Not so broad minded minded as to reject baptism for the mission of sin. Some folks, oh no, that. That doesn't have anything to do with it. You're saved before you're baptized. You're kind of just baptized and just something to kind of get into a, 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 a some sort of a group or something, club. Some formality you go through. Mark 16, verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be in vain. Some folks think they can enter that narrow gate even if they fail to live an obedient life. Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus told those who are about to be martyred for the faith. He said, remain faithful unto death and give you a crown of righteousness. Matthew 16, verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Friends, salvation is free. It's a free gift, but it's not an unconditional gift, as many people think. Notice what he says in verse 24. Strive to enter into the narrow gate, for many, I say unto you, many will seek to enter in and will not be able. Many, I say unto you. Why? Why were they not able? I would say because of their lack of of faith, lack of obedient faith. Not only believing, but doing. 1 John 2, verse 3. Now by this time we know that we know Him. Now by this we know that we know Him. We keep His commandments. You know, think about it. Our salvation cost our Savior His life, His blood. 
Verse 5, verse 8 and 9. Though it was his son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And when he had been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But then Jesus goes on in verse 25 and says, he gives them a parable. He says, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. This points out another important thing here. Who will be saved? The door was to be shut. This is kind of a judgment they seen in my mind. Master of the house here with Jesus, one who controlled the house. The door was to be shut. That means someday that door for those people back then and for us too will be shut for salvation from sin. Now, it will be shut effectively when we pass away. Especially on Judgment Day. That door to the place of safety into the church, Ark of Christ, will be shut. The door to the place of eternal reward will be shut. I'm always reminded how Noah and his and his seven converts were huddled there in that with all those animals in that ark. And it says in Matthew in Genesis 7, verse 16, so those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut that door. Now these people that Jesus mentions here in verse 25, they should have knocked earlier because that door to salvation is never locked. It's never locked. It's always there. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and we give unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. But time is short. Time is short. God has only given us so much time in this world. We're not going to live forever. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He may while He, he is near. Every day the Lord calls us by the gospel. The thing is, have we knocked? Have we responded? Have we responded? And the Master's answer here, Master of the House, to their pleading was, I do not know you where you are from. I don't know where you're... And King James says, I know not whence ye are. Now, why did the Master not know them? Why did the Master not spiritually know them? It may have been because they had the wrong wedding garments. In the book of Matthew, again, Matthew chapter 22, the parable is given of the wedding feast. And a man uh, gets all this feast together and invites everyone to come. They don't come, so they can start bringing other people in. And it says in chapter 22, verse 11, inviting all these people to the wedding feast. And notice in verse 11, when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, Take him away, cast him into outer darkness, for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Perhaps they would not were not clothed in Christ. You know, the book of Galatians tells us, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for as many of you have been baptized have put on Christ. They were, were disobedient. You know, they had opportunity during Jesus' day to be baptized for the mission of their sins. And many, some took advantage of that. But many others did not. Just as they don't today. Now, Jesus goes on in verse 26 and shows the, shows the people are amazed by this and, they, and those that have knocked on the door. Then they will, you will begin to say, we ate in your presence and, and you taught in our streets. There's false confidence. You know, many people broke bread with the Lord but refused his teachings. John 6, verse 26. Most surely I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the signs and for miraculously produced all this food, fed the 5,000, because you ate of the loaves and were filled. 
way that the Lord gave some hard teaching and those who had come to the loaves and fishes turned away and thought, well, who is this? I can't understand this teaching he's given. John 6, verse 60. So here in this parable, the response was astonishing. And I say, my friends, on the day of judgment, there will be many astonished people. What about us? Is our confidence false? Oh, the preacher, I lived a good life. I believe in Jesus. But, but I, and I've lived a good life. So my, my great granddaddy was a preacher. Maybe they haven't obeyed God's plan of salvation. Failing to be baptized for mission of sins. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. It says, In the like figure wherein to even baptism doth now save us, not the move of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of the conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've done what God said to do. Now God does what He said He would do. He promised He would save you from your sins. Maybe you've got confidence in false doctrine and some religious experience you have, and experience, you know, feelings, emotions are a wonderful thing if they're put in context. If they're, if they, if they stand up to biblical scrutiny. Familiarity with Christ, but no obedient faith. Remember, earlier I quoted Matthew 7, verse 21, not all that say to me, Lord, Lord, to the King of Heaven. Verse 22 goes along with that, but many will say, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out demons in thy name and done wonders in thy name? The Lord didn't acknowledge that even that had happened, by the way. But still, there will be many that way. Others have confidence in works of merit that they do. Maybe we're like that. Oh, I'm, I'm good to people. I'm a generous person, and that's fine. We should be generous. Or I've done this, I've done that. Well, that's a matter of degree. It, can anyone compare to the Lord Jesus Christ as far as goodness? I don't think so. No, no saint, so-called, some people claim others are, or holy person, none of that can compare to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, so they were amazed and then notice in verse 27, 28, the eternal agony of being left out. But he will say, I tell you that I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you works iniquity. In spite of their pleading, he repeats this disavowal of them. I don't know who you are, where you're from. What was the reason for his denial? Notice what he says there in verse 27. You workers of iniquity, because their occupation, their job, was sin. Now that includes a lot of things. They may have been hypocrites. They may have been secret sinners, acting like they were really good people, but underneath not. They have been very religious people. They may have been very profane, evil people. Whatever it may be, they were workers of iniquity. Their occupation was sin. Matthew 14, 13, verse 41. Parable of the tares. The Son of Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Those who are sinners. Our question should be, how do I know if I will be denied, am I a worker of anything? Whether it may be secret or public? Notice the response in verse 28. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mind you of that condemned man. In death row. It's here, sir. Condemned woman. They're being marched off to be executed. Oftentimes, they break down in weeping, gnashing of teeth. We can see the scene. Notice in verse 28, verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see. When they see the picture, the eternal picture, the final picture of their destiny. 
is viewed under the new covenant. You will see when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. Oh no, we are sons of Abraham. Not spiritually. Romans 2 verse 8 and 9. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. And finally, we see the grace of God in action through the gospel. There they they rejected, rejected would see God's grace in action. They saw, said someday when you're thrust out of the kingdom, you'll see who's in the kingdom. There's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom. All these Old Testament patriarchs, prophets would be saved. You'll be thrust out. But then he adds here in verse 29, and they will come from the east to the west, from the north to the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. Other places that, that refers to the Gentiles. The <coughs> Gentiles, as well as the Jews, would be in the kingdom. They couldn't accept that. You know, the kingdom is open to all. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon me and learn me. For I'm making lowly of heart, you should find a rest for your soul. Long last, that kingdom would be open to all because of the gospel. Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness? Even the righteousness of faith, Paul says. In Acts 10, verse 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth before Cornelius and his household and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. And here we see what God's grace is all about. In verse 3, Indeed there, there, uh, indeed there are last who shall be first, and there are first who shall be last. See, my friends, God's grace is unconditional unto it. Everyone is an opportunity to go to heaven. To strive to enter that narrow gate. It's not open just to Jew, to Greek, just to the religious or the self or the righteous as they perceive righteousness. It's open to everybody to obey the gospel. Second Corinthians nine verse fifteen, thanks be to God for his in, indescribable gift. Now we need to ask ourselves, have we obeyed the gospel of Christ? God's grace. But we've done that tonight. And believed, repented, confessed, and baptized from the mission of sins. That's <clears throat> your need tonight. Please come as we stand aside. Lord.
to Thee, I'm forever more to be. Lord, I give my life to Thee, I'm forever more to be. Lord, I give my love.